Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine. My favorite group, the emerging great number. Anyway, uh, uh, what what another fabulous week. Um, Tony Fauci is now considered a disaster, uh, along with those other idiots. Uh, and of course, uh, some good news. The uh, Moderna vaccine is closing in on uh, its endpoints to, for its phase three trial, and so is Pfizer. So it looks like uh, somewhere around late November or December, we sh should start getting uh, information about whether or not those are going to be ready for prime time. Uh, so that will be really, really good because Frankly, that, that would be helpful. The WHO, we love the WHO, they just had a, a report uh, looking at uh, uh, 11,000 people, 405 hospitals in 30 countries, randomized to various treatment uh, uh, regimens. And what they concluded was remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, and interferon beta uh, had absolutely no effect or little effect. So. Uh, so much for the remdesivir uh, opportunity. Um, anyway, so we're looking forward to the vaccine. Looks like the monoclonals are going to be very effective, though. Uh, so we have that, and we still have uh, dexamethasone. So we've got ways to treat, but, you know, it's getting narrowed with um, I increasing information we're getting uh, to know what, what actually works and what doesn't. Science is a good thing for that purpose. So let's review uh, what's going on here in the Texas Medical Center. Uh, I would say it's uh, it, nationally, as you know, the, the numbers look terrible. We are clearly in the fall surge that everyone anticipated, almost certainly uh, because of cold weather and people being indoors. Uh, the upper Midwest is a total mess. Uh, luckily for us, we're in the south. Uh, we've seen our numbers begin to trickle up. Uh, our effective uh, uh, RT number has been sort of hovering around one. It's not like where it used to be. We need to have it less than one for us to really be feeling like we have the epidemic under control and it's not there. Our test positivity rate's been running under 5%, but it's not going down anymore. It was going steadily down. We actually had it under 4% for a while and it's back over 4%. And then the other thing is our new case rate. You know, we, we were very trying to get our case rate down below 200. It shot up to 600 last week. It's been hovering around 5 to 600 this week. So that is not good and that's not very helpful. And then I'm sure you've seen the news in the school district um, had to close about 15, 16 uh, schools because of outbreaks or at least having test positivity. Uh, you know, I give them credit. They're trying. Uh, they're struggling. Everybody's struggling. I don't think schools have to close because there's one or two cases. It really is uh, how effective you are, are using the usual strategies around wearing masks and social distancing. And so I think uh, we're all learning in this process and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to make some, some progress. My concern, frankly, is that we're beginning to see hospitalizations trickle up. Uh, I, I told you we don't really like to follow that specifically for community spread. But it does reflect the fact that we are not doing as well as we could. So I thought I'd uh, address a couple of things this week. You know, there's been a lot of debate. Are we really doing okay? Are we not doing okay? What, how are we doing relative to the rest of the world? And the answer is we're not doing so good. Uh, you know, if you look at it, there was a publication that came out in JAMA this past week that compared all the different countries and what their uh, mortality rate was, and they did it in a very interesting way. They started off, what's the beginning of the epidemic and what was the mortality rate? Because we were all unprepared, no matter what country, we were unprepared. But it, then it was like, how did you handle it? So what was the mortality rate since May, and then what was the mortality rate since June? And they clustered them into three groups, low mortality rate countries like South Korea, Japan, and Australia, moderate mortality rates, some of the European countries in Israel, and then high mortality rates uh, that included France, Sweden, Italy, the United Kingdom, Spain, and Belgium, and us. And uh, the numbers are pretty impressive. If you look at uh, early on, at the start of the, of the pandemic, uh, in the high mortality countries, they range from a high of Belgium being 86 uh, deaths per 100,000 down to uh, the Netherlands, which was 36 per 100,000, and the United States was at 60. If you look, though, as what, what did you do in response 
how did you handle that? Uh, mortality rates dropped in all those other countries but two, Sweden and the U.S. Uh, Sweden went from 57 to 23 and then down to 10. The U.S. went from 60 to 36, then to 27 uh, deaths per 100,000. If you compare it to like the United Kingdom or Italy, there are five or three, or the Netherlands, one. You can see on a per capita basis, we have not done a great job. And it's not just the size of the country. God love Israel. They've done a terrible job as well. <laughs> they, they started off at 14 per 100,000 and haven't been able to get it below 10, while all of their comparable uh, moderate mortality countries have been well under one. So, you know, then there's been the argument, well, are we really counting COVID correctly? You know, uh, maybe, maybe we're not judging it right. So one way to look at that is we know mortality over the last 10 years in, over the same period of time, from when it all started to the months now, all seven months. And you can look at what's the excess mortality. So how many more people died during that period of time? Forget the diagnosis. And it's a good reflection since COVID is the major and leading cause of death that those are COVID deaths. And if you look at excess mortality, it's the same countries. It's Israel not doing well, Sweden not doing well, and the United States is the worst. Uh, almost uh, four or five times more than Israel and uh, six or seven times more than Sweden. So. The fact of the matter is, no matter how you look at it, we haven't been handling it uh, very well. And, and you know, you got to wonder, uh, why is that? Well, I'll go back to the R number. You know, that's this, the famous <laughs> effective reproduction number and, and all of the, the, the variables that, that, you, that make up that, that particular number. So, if you recall, uh, it's the number of contacts that are very much involved, how infectious you are and how long you're in circulation, plus the last thing is the susceptibility of the population. So we assume right now the entire population is susceptible because we don't have, uh, we don't have a vaccine. So what are the things that we as individuals can do? Well, we can wear masks. We can, we can stay socially distant. We can wash our hands. Those are things that we as individuals can do. Our policies like closing churches, limiting gatherings, those are things that locking down, those are not, not popular and no one's been able to do that again really since the start. So what's the, what's the difference between us and these other comparable countries? And I, I can't help but think that it is because we don't have a universal policy, that we have not been able as a country uh, to have policies that are consistent. We have governors that have mask policies and we have governors that don't. Uh, we have people in the country who don't believe that masks are important. We have people that don't. And as a result, that kind of mixed view where we can't get everybody on the same page, I think is responsible for why, uh, why we have not been able to get this uh, under control. So was, uh, some people have now, because of that, started a new strategy, which I'd like to call total capitulation. <laughs> Rather than try, you know, individually, like, Let's get this done as a, as a people. Let's, the United States of America will all pull together and do this. The new strategy is, well, forget it all. We just give up. And, and that would be the herd immunity approach. So herd immunity is fascinating, right? I mean, it's a nice concept. It works sometimes. Uh, the way you usually achieve herd immunity is you, have, you vaccinate people. So you have fewer and fewer people who are actually susceptible. And the reason herd immunity is really important is because not everybody can get vaccinated. Uh, some people have immune deficiencies or they're, or they're sick with other complications. And in order to protect them, if the rest of the, everyone is protected, then it also protects those people. Uh, so it's really important to achieve herd, herd immunity through vaccination. But the way you don't want to do it is the way people are suggesting, which is not just give up and let everybody get infected and we'll forget about it. So one of the things to understand about how num what's the number of people that you have to be infected to actually achieve herd immunity. So let's let's not I'm not going to you know make an editorial comment. Let's actually think about it. Let's achieve herd immunity through just letting the infections run rampant through our country, as as several people have suggested. So what would that do? Well, first of all, you have to look at uh, what percentage of the population would actually have to be a infected to achieve herd immunity. And so with really highly infectious disease, remember I mentioned measles with an R value above 10, almost 15 or 18, you'd have to have 95% of the population 
uh, vaccinated or having had measles before you could prevent, uh, before you reached uh, herd immunity. And that's classic. That's why measles outbreaks happen all the time when people let their guard down and, you know, 10 or 15 percent of the population doesn't get vaccinated, there's a measles outbreak. Well, if you look at SARS-CoV-2, it would be about 60 percent. So we'd have to get about 60 percent of the population infected uh, for, for us to actually achieve herd immunity. So what would the impact of that be? You know, let's, let's not mess around here. Let's really figure that out. So um, if uh, there are 320 million people in the United States, and we have to achieve herd immunity by having 65% infected, that's 208 uh, million people would have to be infected. And let's, we've learned a lot. We know that 40% of the people who get infected are asymptomatic. So uh, that means that 60% are symptomatic, that's 125 million people. And then if you go like one in 10 of those is likely to be hospitalized, that's the data we have right now, that's about 12 and a half million people. And I'll just show you the data we have from the Texas uh, Medical Center our mortality rate has been chugging down, but it's, it's been persistently right around 10%. So about 10% of the cases that get hospitalized, uh, actually the patients die. So if it's 1 in 10, and we say 12.5 million people will be uh, hospitalized, that's 1.25 million people who could die if we just let it run through the community. Well, we've got new therapies. Let's not forget new therapies. And the monoclonal antibodies are thought to maybe reduce mortality by as much as 25%. So that gets it down. If, you know, if we let things go crazy and we just let everybody get infected, we, we, we could anticipate about a million deaths. So how does, I, you know, a million deaths, it's like crazy to think about, but how do you put that in perspective? Well, AIDS epidemic started in the 80s. So 40 years ago, 700,000 people have died from AIDS in the United States. In, with flu, somewhere between 10 to, and 50,000 people die each year. Uh, in the Vietnam War, there were 58,000 USA deaths, and in World War II, there were 400,000 deaths. So that's a million people. Think about that relative to the numbers I just mentioned. And then the other thing that people forget is our hospital systems would be overrun. Uh, Admissions to the hospital of all these COVID-infected patients would crowd out other people. And so people would die from cancer and cardiovascular disease because they couldn't get in the hospitals. And the other thing is, don't forget, a lot of our hospitals were financially failing because of the COVID uh, epidemic uh, in, in the U.S. So, you know, we would have failures of hospitals. So I'm not sure, you know, if you look at it, you know, objectively, the concept of let's just let everybody get infected and go our own way. I think is, is really a bad uh, strategy. So capitulation I don't think is a good one. Not to mention the fact that it would also pick on different communities. It wouldn't be distributed evenly. The, the Latinx community would be hit five times more hard, harder than anybody else. The African American community would as well. So those things are just not uh, you know, reasonable to think about. So if people, if your friends say, look, why don't we just go our way and do whatever we want, that's what would happen, and it would not be uh, pretty, and it's not the right strategy. So uh, as we uh, think about that, the, the, the data this week, and we're coming up on the holiday season again, as I mentioned last week, uh, the virus isn't going anywhere. Things aren't different. You know, remember, you've got to think about masks and, and not having multifamily get-togethers during the holidays. Uh, Dr. McDevitt wrote a very nice uh, little article about how to form a family bubble, which I thought was very thoughtful. You might want to take a look at that. But the idea is if you're going to bring family members who've been far apart back in, figure out a way to quarantine, maybe get tested, make sure that you all are being very strategic in your gatherings. Every major outbreak has been from family gatherings so far. So let's, let's not make that uh, mistake. And as we think about the holidays, uh, uh, I'm very happy to say at the end of this uh, today, we're going to have the Doc Capella group singing old Bill Withers' favorite, Lean On Me. I think we all need to lean on each other. It's going to be a, it's a very difficult next couple of months, uh, and let's all work together. That's what's great about Baylor College of Medicine. We all work together. We all participate. It's a great institution. We're doing everything we can to help each other uh, get through this. So uh, have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Lean on me. When you're not strong And I'll be your friend 
I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on. You just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem that you'd understand. We all need somebody to lean on. Lean on me when you're not strong. Somebody to leave